Welcome, my friends, to Stay Home, Stay Focused. I'm Jack Moline. I'm the president of Interfaith Alliance, and uh, we're here for the next 20 minutes or so chatting with my colleague, my good friend, and my predecessor, uh, Greg LaBelle. Welcome, Greg. Thank you, Jack. It's nice to see you. It's good to see you. You know, the first thing I ask everybody is how you're doing in these times. Um, doing, you know, doing well. I, I we're, you know, I, I think I, I realize in in going through this that that for for Glenn and me, this is really sort of a a, a big inconvenience, uh, and that's kind of it. Uh, Glenn is working at home. Uh, as you know, I'm pretty much retired now, still doing a few things, um, and we're not facing some of the really terrible things that 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 other people. Um, here in the United States and around the world are facing. We don't have, I mean, we don't have kids at home. We're not, you know, we're, we're not seeing our incomes go away. So um, I, I have absolutely no right to complain. <laughs> well, you have a right to complain, but well. <laughs> perhaps not as loudly as everybody else. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> um, and are you in DC or are you out in Delaware where I know you spent just, some time? Just, just north of the DC line in Tacoma Park, Maryland. Very nice. Well, one of our one of our staff members there, my colleague Jay Keller, lives in Tacoma Park. Oh also. yes, of course, yes. He told me that last week um, he got a message from one of his neighbors that everyone should come out on their porch at five thirty with a drink, and they'd have the opportunity to yell at each other as they always wanted to do. <laughs> That's a great idea. <laughs> so you should go down to that neighborhood, stand in the middle of the street. There's That's there's right. nobody driving. Yeah, that's right. That's called coping. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Uh, Greg, I, I wonder if for the benefit of our uh, viewers and listeners who may not know you as well as the rest of us, you tell us about the work that you've been doing, you did for many years before you retired from the George Washington University and what you're doing these days. Sure. Um, and in a sense, I, I'm, I'm still doing some of that, although I've been officially retired um, for, for three years now. Uh, but when I was at the George Washington University, my background is in, as, as you know, Jack, is in, is in politics, is in electoral politics, um, going back to George McGovern's campaign in 1972, which was my first paid political job. Um, and um, after having done that for those, uh, th that sort of work for a number of years, uh, about 25 years ago, I actually um, moved over, uh, not entirely, but moved, got a, got a faculty position at George Washington University at the Graduate School of Political Management. Um, and in addition to teaching uh, uh, graduate courses, I had the opportunity about a dozen, 14 years ago, uh, uh, to begin to do some work uh, with, particularly around Native American issues. Um, we, we created, uh, while I was there, uh, two uh, programs, scholarship programs for Native American students, one for its college students and one for high school students. Uh, and before I left, um, uh, the last thing that, that I did was we, we created what we call the Center for Indigenous Politics and Policy at GW, which was a, an opportunity to sort of pull a lot of the work we've been doing with, with students together into a broader context of research and advocacy uh, on Native issues. And um, I am just at, at interesting this, at, at this juncture because I went three, six months ago, they asked me to come back um, for a little bit of time. There was, a, the, the, the center was going through some transition. And so I, I went back as sort of an interim director um, in between uh, the, the, the change in, in, um, in, in permanent um, uh, directorships there. Uh, and had an opportunity to sort of re-engage uh, in, in the work, um, particularly the work of the center, um, which has been really rewarding and continues to be an important uh, important aspect of, of, of my life and interest. Terrific. And I know you worked on uh, Mayor Pete Buttigieg's presidential campaign. I think we'll come back to that in a minute. Okay. All right. But great. I want to ask you now in these, in these times of, of stress and quarantine for us, other than keeping yourself and your husband safe, what are you focused on? Well, it's, it's, I was thinking about that um, um, earlier today, and I, as I as I sort of clicked on CNN and then clicked it off, um, and I think, in, in some ways, Jack, it's what I'm not focusing on. I guess I'm I'm in sort of a different place than your than your earlier um, um, interviewees because, as I said, I'm 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 really sort of in a at least a semi-retired sort of sort of mode. Uh, I'm trying um, not to get uh, to watch too much TV, particularly too much well TV in general, but certainly. Uh, um, try to turn the news off uh, and, and sort of give myself a little a little breather from that. Um, I, um, um, as I said, I'm continuing to do work um, with with the center, which is an important 
uh, outlet for me. Um, I am, um, besides that, again, you mentioned the Buttigieg campaign, which of course has now come to an end, but uh, uh, I'm also a lay leader at my, at my church, at uh, All Souls Episcopal Church in DC. Um, which is taking up a lot of time, as you well know, as, yeah. as we houses of worship are facing these challenging times and finding ways to be a part of the lives of our, of, of our congregations uh, in ways that, um, that don't require that we're all sitting in the same room. Um, so it's been a real, uh, that, that's been uh, something that's been absorbing uh, more of my time. And I have to say that um, the other piece is, uh, Glenn and I are, have a sort of unofficial niece. Um, she will be eight in May. She's home with her parents. Both her parents are working from home now. And um, we have found that I can actually video babysit for Gabby, uh, which is uh, the high point of, of the day. In fact, I'll be doing it later today. Uh, we're, we're gonna spend an hour together at four o'clock. It gives her parents an opportunity to sort of focus on their work and, and, and uh, not worry about her. And we get to play games and read together. And I can't tell you what a wonderful uh, sort of sort of medicine that is for all that we're in right now. That's that's great. My wife is is doing the same thing for an hour every afternoon with our five year old granddaughter. Ah, while yes. Her two year old brother takes a nap. Yep. And, um, <laughs> yeah. I get brought in for fifteen minutes of Passover school uh, <laughs> as part of that hour. So that's, it, yeah, it's wonderful. And it's not only a great break for her parents; it's a great break for Anne and me from. Yeah. From staring at a screen with work all day. Exactly. You're, yeah, that's I, that's my experience exactly with it. So we've we've had to find, as you said, a, a, at least a temporary new norm to deal with here. And you having this background in electoral politics, and especially having been so involved in a very intense campaign for the Democratic nomination, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what these times are going to do to our democratic processes because we still have an election scheduled for November. It, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting and, and, uh, question and, and there's a complex answer to it or many, many answers to it, I think. Um, and I think to, we have to back up a little bit and realize that we were already in a, 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 in a unique position in this country. And I think that the, um, the, the Trump years um, will, we, will, will leave us changed from where we were before uh, 2016. Um, and I think we're, we're beginning to sort of, we were just beginning to get a sort of sense of what that might be um, when, when, when this, this virus hit, um, which leads again to that, that, that broader question. How do we, what, are, what will we be like when we come out of this? Um, we won't be the same, um, either uh, uh, the, in, in, the, in the post, in a post Trump um, presidency um, or in, in a post uh, coronavirus world. Um, and I and and I think for me anyway the, the the jury is is certainly out on 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 the latter of those two. Um, I've had conversations with, with several friends over the over the last couple of weeks about about this very question. Do we come out of this um, more polarized, uh, more distrustful and suspicious of each other, uh, or do we find um, in this process that we begin to recognize? That we are all in this together, that we share uh, wherever we come from, and 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 whatever uh, our, our beliefs are, um, that there's that there is a common a common purpose and a common good here that 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 we recognize through through this process, um, and I think we're sort of on the bubble right now. I don't I don't think we really know um, where this will go. In terms of the um, um, now nitty gritty, in terms of of the election, uh, obviously the whole thing has been thrown into a, a state of um, um, uh, almost suspension um, right now. I'm aware the president is certainly making sure he's on television every day. Um, the presumptive nominee, Joe Biden, is trying desperately to um, find ways to communicate with the American people from, from the family room um, in his home in, in, in Delaware. Um, and um, we still have yet um, to formally resolve of the question of who the, the Democratic nominee will be. Um, the other thing that occurs to me is the question is, what will these conventions, what, how are we going to run conventions this summer? Um, it, it's hard to imagine that we'll be in a position to be able to run a traditional convention where thousands of people get together in a gigantic room uh, and spend three or four days kind of hanging out together. Um, and I'm sure these conversations are going on in, in smaller rooms uh, or, or like this um, all around the country now and figuring out sort of how is this going to work? Um, 
we're on really we're in really uncharted territory in a lot of ways right now. I think there's certainly no constitutional precedent for uh, changing the time of the election or of either extending or truncating the term of office of anybody in federal office. Right. Right. But can you imagine for us a scenario or two of what could happen if we are still dealing with these health crises as we get closer to the time of the election? Again, um, an, an important and 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 uh, question with an unclear answer. You will remember that after 9/11, uh, the the uh, the mayoral race um, in uh, in New York was actually postponed uh, because I believe it was to happen the next day, right on the 12th. Uh, and they did postpone uh, the mayoral election, but that's a very different situation than obviously a presidential election. Um, the, you're right, there, there, there is no precedence for it. Um, I'm not aware, I'm not a constitutional scholar, uh, but I'm not aware of anything in the constitution that allows for flexibility um, around the, the, the date of the election and the, and, the, and the date of the change of administrations. That's all been worked out um, prior. Um, I, I, I'm a bit of a cynic um, with with the um, or at least a skeptic with with the um, uh, with the current administration, and I, I it wouldn't um, it wouldn't surprise me if that became a topic of conversation for political reasons. Uh, and I don't know. Uh, uh, I, I, we have learned to expect the unexpected um, with this, as with everything else. Uh, it concerns me. Uh, I suspect. Uh, that, um, um, that that there would be a very strong negative reaction to any attempt uh, to change that. Um, um, but uh, again, you know, we expect the unexpected these days. You and I have spent a lot of time over the past 25 years that Interfaith Alliance has been uh, in existence, uh, worrying about the influence and the role of uh, religious organizations and faith-based communities in this electoral process. Mm. Um, how does that change given the way that uh, one set of uh, faith communities has lined up in support of the president and another seems to have lined up opposed to much of what he's doing with what we're facing electorally right now? I, I suspect it won't change well, I, I, I may be wrong. I was, I was going to say, I, I suspect it won't change dramatically. We continue to see the religious right um, take these positions, which are, I would, I would say, more political than faith-based. Um, I read another, there, there's another story in the Washington Post today about um, uh, some of the big Christian megachurches and smaller right. Christian churches that are, are, are telling their people, no, we're going to get together. This is not real. This is, this is a made up thing by the people who want to get at Donald Trump. And these are religious leaders uh, who are making this argument. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I don't know how they sleep at night, I guess is the best way to put it. I really don't. Um, when, 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 when you're putting people in what every, what the, 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 the scientific community clearly tells us uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a dangerous situation and they're encouraging their folks to put themselves in, in, in this danger, these dangerous situations. Um, I think that um, on the other side, I think uh, progressive religious communities, um, again, have always been very cautious and careful, I think, about um, um, overstepping um, constitutional um, issues and so on and so forth and, and how they get engaged um, in, in, the, in the political world. Um, but we may see that change a little bit. This, 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 all of this may be enough to, uh, to, to push um, some of the progressive um, um, communities into being a little bit more vocal. And you mentioned uh, Pete Buttigieg, for whom I worked. Um, and uh, I think Pete was was someone who, um, for whom uh, his 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 faith, um, the the way he grew up, uh, the, the the faith that he identifies with now, um, is an important aspect of his life, which is the case for so many of us. I mean, there's no yes. question about that. I mean, yes. two of us are talking to each other right now, um, and I think that. But I think that um, um, Pete found a way to talk about his values that are born in part of his, of, uh, by his, uh, born in a part of his faith in a way that was, uh, is authentic uh, and, and isn't a sort of my way or the highway kind of, kind of language, which is sort of what we're used to 
um, particularly when Christians are talking about <laughs> when conservative Christians are, are, are making these cases. So I think, um, uh, and, and, and I know for a fact that there were um, um, people who identify as Democrat, members of the Democratic Party, people who are in positions in the Democratic Party, who were actually alarmed when they started hearing this. And um, I think that um, that alone may have begun to change some of some of some of that, which I think is 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 not a bad thing, but um, but it's a it's a risky thing. It is it is a good thing that people are able to talk more frankly about their personal beliefs. I would yeah. agree with you. The constitutional issue, though, is an interesting one. It is. Um, we have, uh, as you mentioned, some of the I will hope that they are the fringe members of the religious right. Who are insisting that faith is going to protect them from science yeah. as we struggle yeah. with this. And yet, those of us in what you describe well as the more progressive community insist that the Constitution protects beliefs and religious practices, no matter how wacky we may think they are. Yeah. Yeah. What is someone who is an advocate of the constitutional protections of freedom of religion supposed to do about groups that insist on violating the quarantine and social distance requirements? It, it, again, <laughs> you raise some really powerful and, and complicated questions. Um, and, and I relate to this directly. And I think that we have seen it in, in other ways as well. And I think one of the debates that's going has been going on in this country for a while is I think is, is the line between um, the constitutional protection of, of, of religion um, or, or protection from religion, uh, if, is, if, if that's where you are, um, uh, which, is, which is sort of up against that question of how one functions in the public square um, um, and, and, and that sort of, the, the connection between those two, I think, uh, I think of Hobby Lobby uh, as a good example, one that just sort of uh, drove me a little crazy at the time, sort of, you know, when, when you're running a business, um, there are, you know, there, there are laws about um, non-discrimination and so on and so forth. When you, uh, not uh, in all kinds of businesses and so on and so forth. And so we're, and I think we're still trying to figure out where that line is um, between um, the, someone's right to live according to whatever religious precepts he or she holds, as, as you said, however wacky, um, um, and, and, and the, the, the requirement that, that they, in, 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 their, in, in the publics where they treat, their, uh, they treat the rest of, the rest of us um, with dignity and with equality and with respect. I don't think we know where that line is yet. I think we're still trying to figure that out. And I'm and not sure that we will. I, I think we have plenty of time to think about it over the Me next too. few weeks. <laughs> yeah. we're, uh, we're nearing the end of our time, Greg, and I, I've asked each of my guests if they would suggest something to people who are watching or listening at home that they might do to create a little fuller day than simply worrying about the coronavirus. What would you I, and I think we talked, oh, I'm sorry, I think we talked about it at the beginning. I think um, um, and, and thank God for social media is all I can say, because I mean, <laughs> connecting with family, um, 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 it's just having a, a, a Zoom conversation, uh, you know, with, or FaceTime conversation um, with family who are far away or who we can't see um, uh, uh, physically go visit right now. Um, spend some time with a kid. I, I, I think you and I are on the same page with that. Yep. I mean, these are the things that, that, that I actually, I mean, this, 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 these times are actually little blessings for me, I think. And I think um, I would highly recommend that. It's a great way to look at it. Greg LaBelle, you're a, you're a good friend of mine, you're a good friend of our organization, and you're a good friend of people of faith, no matter their perspective. So thank you for being with us today. Please uh, be well yourself and to our viewers and listeners, stay home. Stay focused. Thanks, Jack.